in the past uh, few weeks, I've had multiple conversations with a number of people, both in and out of our congregation, uh, who express a great deal of concern over what's going to happen in the next seven days. If you haven't already, some of you will go off to the polls and you will elect a leader, much as Emily just prayed. But as I talk to people within the congregation and again outside of the congregation, I notice that the older you are, the more worried you are. And yet, the younger you are, the more you have at stake. When my father worries about the elections, and he does, I tell him, you're 94. <laughs> Not a lot can happen. <laughs> And yet, that's where so much of the angst is coming from. If any, it should be the younger who would worry, since they have longer to live down what could be disastrous results, if I listen to some of you. So perhaps now, I hear things falling in two categories. I hear fear, and I hear anger. Afraid of what one side might do if they get control and anger at what one side has already done. Now might be a good time to restate the obvious. Neither of those are the spirit of God. For God has not given you the spirit of fear. He's given you the spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. And anger does not work the righteousness of God. Wherever those emotions come from, and however we justify them, they are not coming from God, and they will not lead to things from God. Are we all right? So whatever you do, and I know you'll be careful, it's hard to improve on the words of Wesley, isn't it? 150 years ago when he spoke to his little society, he said, vote for the person you deem most worthy. Speak no evil against the person you vote against. And take care that your own spirit is not poisoned toward others who voted opposite the way you did. Those are good words. And they lead into what I really want to talk about. I want to put five words before you this morning. Um, and here they are. Transformation. Humility. Diversity. Community. And generosity. Whatever we do as Christians, however we vote as Christians, our mission and identity is not wrapped up in the political narrative. Our mission is to build an alternative society. In 1967, if you're keeping score, Lyndon Johnson was president. That's the first president I can remember. That dates me. The reason I know this is because my father said he was going to sell us to the Russians. <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> the one to be trusted, he said, was Richard Nixon. <laughs> I'm telling you, we have been here before. In 1967, the writer, philosopher for sure, maybe lay theologian, Jockey Lull, wrote a little-known book called The Political Illusion, in which he said that the symptom of his day was that all things had become political in nature. Whatever the problem, it arose from political origins. Therefore, 
it must have political solutions. And whenever somebody wanted to participate, they had political ambitions. The symptoms of this, he said, was to couch all things in the language of politics. It was to watch the spread of a government power over more and more of the public. And he said, it was the passion and the fervor with which citizens came to whenever the subject of politics came up. He was discouraged that in his generation, this is almost 60 years ago, Christians never became that passionate about even their own subjects as they were passionate about political ones. Boy, am I glad those days have passed. <laughs> about the same time I was reading this, I was reading James Davison Hunter's latest Democracy and Solidarity, in which he spends almost 400 pages outlining the problems of our civilization today, and only the last 10 in some sort of solution. I was waiting for the solution, and the solutions were in the broadest of terms. Most of them had to do with what Hunter called communities of moral imagination, or what Jonathan Sachs, the rabbi, called a creative minority. It's a community of people that live within civilization but they live distinct from civilization and they practice different ways. When I read of it, I thought of the third way. In the first church, Christians were called members of the third way. This implies there were two others. And one of those was the Roman way in which the government tried to take religion and conform it to the government. The second way was the Jewish way in which the people tried to take the government and conform it to the ways of religion. It was theocratic. The third way was a community of people that were neither trying to change their religion nor trying to co-opt their culture. They were living as a creative minority within that culture and without leaving society, engaging the culture in creative ways and yet remaining true to their identity. This is who we ought to become, church. When the early church started, the political climate was at least as combustible as it is today. Power was moving to the hands of a few. Just a few decades before Paul wrote his first letter, the government named its first emperor because its republic, its collection of states was disintegrating so they caved in to the authoritarian impulse and appointed an emperor. And then power moved to the hands of the few. This created more and more people living on the margins, disinherited, disempowered, because they had no access to either goods or the people who had them. It created sharp distinctions in the classes and several different minorities. I just point that out to say that when Paul started to write his letters, he was not writing to congregations all over that were living in mostly peace. He was talking to people 
that felt in their bones everything you're feeling this morning. They didn't know what was going to happen, and they had a lot at stake. And it wasn't going to change necessarily in the next four years. Emperors could go for decades. Some did. And Paul's strategy was neither to withdraw nor to overpower. It was to create an alternative to the current culture that grew up alongside that culture and lived in a different way. And that, I think, is our strategy today. This is why when you read Paul's letters, and I'm trusting you read Paul's letters. If you're familiar with them, please read them again. And this time, slow down. And when you get to the part where Paul is talking about what we would say are ethics, ways to behave, remember, despite the American individualism he was not speaking primarily to individuals he was speaking to little communities so the qualities that he put out there patience and forbearing and forgiveness and love and compassion in Paul's mind, and we can hardly get our minds around this as Americans because we think as individuals. We think of all of these things as virtues we possess. But this is not how Paul wrote them. He wrote them to be virtues that we pass on to somebody else. So these are not virtues that go on our resumes. These are virtues that describe the way the people of God live with one another. Are you with me so far? I, I, this is important because I'm afraid when I read these things, and I'm going to read them in a second, uh, that the tendency is to say, oh, how do I become more of that? And if you do that, you're more American. That's not what Paul is doing. Paul is simply saying, is this quality the one being passed on? Like, did you see it when you came in the room this morning? When you were sitting in your pew? When you greeted one another? When you met with people in the atrium? Did you see these qualities being passed freely throughout the room? So I started putting Paul's descriptions in front of me. Here's, I'm just going to read them to you. I'm going I'm to read them over you. Is that all right? I got to do this. One, two, three. I can go back five pews, they say, and then I'm in trouble. This is as far as I can go. And you put the first one up on the screen. Church, love is patient. Love is kind. It's not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Hmm. And yet what have we been doing? It does not rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And there is never a point in the argument where love ends. And then out of Galatians, stand fast in the freedom with which Christ has set you, College West, free. And don't become in bondage to the yoke of slavery. But don't use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love. Serve one another. If you bite and devour one another, be careful or you'll be consumed by one another. And then, go, and then Ephesians, 
Practice humility with patience and gentleness. Bear with one another in love. Make every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Put away all falsehood and speak truthfully to one another for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. And the one among us who has been stealing must steal no longer, but work instead so you have something to share with people in need. Don't take, give. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Mmm. Mmm. But only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God, through Christ, forgave you. The word of the Lord. And then Philippians. If you have encouragement with Christ, if you have fellowship in the Spirit, be like-minded having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others more than you consider yourself. Look not only onto your interests, look also onto the interests of others. My mentor tells me the English has distorted that. There is in Greek, know your own interests. It finishes by saying, look only onto the interests of others. It's even more powerful. And then Colossians. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, Bear with each other. Forgive each other whatever grievances you have. Forgive like the Lord forgave you. And then over all of these virtues, put on love because it binds them together in perfect unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. The word of the Lord. In Romans chapter 12, the passage that was read a few moments ago from the platform, all five of these virtues are listed in exactly the order we gave them. The first is transformation. The passage is on the screen. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. The second is humility. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but in accordance with the measure of faith God has assigned. The third is diversity. Only here he is speaking not of ethnicity, he is speaking of diversity in giftedness or calling. It's a beautiful way to approach the subject because in today's society, it's less incendiary. It has less baggage. And here he talks about many members having different gifts. And out of that, he speaks of community. He says, this is how the people of God should live when they get in the same room, they love, they pray with, they honor, they are members of one another. And finally, he speaks of generosity. Share with the people among you who are in need. Practice hospitality. It's a form of generosity. Bless when somebody curses you. The blessing is a form of generosity. How are we doing? Let me unpack these very, very quickly, and then I have an exercise that we're going to do. Transformation is not confirmation, 
by another religious organization. Becoming a member, and I value this highly because belonging, I think, is an important part of the biblical vision. But becoming a member does not itself transform you. And transformation is not conformity into one other organization. When you leave the society you belong to and you conform to another society, that is not necessarily transformation. Transformation is a deep-seated change in what Paul called the inner being, where every inclination and every bent of inclination has been taken over by God. This happens in the deepest part of our being and then it quickly works its way to the surface so it's visible in our relationships in our imaginations in our desires in our dispositions in our instincts It is possible to be so transformed that when something goes wrong, you don't have to remind yourself how you're supposed to act. You just act. And it is the way of Christ. I've said this before. Do you think Jesus woke up and said, what would Jesus do? He simply did it. And it was good. And it felt right to him. It was natural. That was too long. I'm sorry. Humility. Humility is not thinking worse of yourself. Humility is seeing yourself the way God sees you. And sometimes for some of you then, that would mean an increase in the way you see yourself. It, it, it wouldn't be a decrease. Humility is seeing yourself as God sees you and seeing yourself in right proportion to other people in the room. If you met a humble person, you would know it. They would not. Because humble people don't think about being humble. They don't think of themselves much at all. Diversity. Diversity in the American way is to begin with your differences and then to pull you aside into a circle of others with the same differences and to play those differences off of the majority. But diversity as Paul meant it in the church, and this is why spiritual gifts are the perfect way to talk about it, diversity is only discovered as an individual engages with the body, not withdraws from the body. My individuality, my distinctiveness, my giftedness, my differences become clear as I immerse myself into the whole and then it is in that immersion into the body, my distinctiveness becomes clear to me. I'm still distinct, but I'm distinct within the body of Christ, not apart from the body of Christ. 
you look bored. Sing this. And if you know parts, if you know parts, sing the parts, even if you can't sing. Praise God from whom all blessings. Come on, church. Praise him, all creatures. Oh, listen to us. Praise him, all ye heavens. Praise Father. Sing the amen. Wow. Man, you guys are good. Wow. Did you hear what happens? Some of you were singing alto. Some of you singing tenor. Some of you were singing bass. Some of you were, I don't know what it was. But what you heard was not just a collection of individual parts. You did not hear altos saying, we're the altos, or the bass saying, we're the bass. You heard individual parts occupying the same space, not competing for the same space, but blending in harmony with others and it created something that was more beautiful than if any one of us would have sang alone. So what am I saying? I'm saying your part becomes valuable when it is immersed into the harmony that God has built. God has made us different. We're supposed to be different. And if we're not, something in that Sound is lost, but to start by looking at differences instead of looking at the harmony and why differences create harmony. The message for a broken society is not I matter. The message is, you need me. Even if you've forgotten that, you need me because the sound loses something when I'm not in it. But man, I need you. That was way too long for community. Diversity is good as it yields harmony in community. We believe in our church that a decision to follow Jesus Christ unites us with the triune God who is a community. He is not a collection of individuals. He is a highly functioning community, and the decision to follow Jesus immerses us into that community, and it also immerses us into one another's lives. So any decision to follow Jesus places us within the body of Christ with others who have also followed Jesus. And finally, generosity. We believe that whatever God has given us, we are to share. We believe, I'll put it this way, you can write your emails later, um, See, Emily's gone. Um, we believe in the voluntary redistribution of wealth. See, the, 
This is why Jesus should be more unpopular with conservatives than he apparently is. Because conservatives have forgotten this entire, he said, he said more about your wealth than he said about prayer. Really, I'm not making this up. If we ignore this, we've lost a massive part of Jesus' teaching. He believes in the voluntary redistribution of wealth. Now, I know I've taken a long time to unpack this, but look, and I'm almost done. Um, but can I tell you why this is, this is important because this is the alternative society God is trying to form. If he could, if God could raise up people who were deeply and consistently transformed, it would spill into a humble spirit and in humility, other people become more important to us, especially those who are not like us but that is only good for us as it is immersed in something larger than us called community. And as that community shares what God has given them, they become a powerful force. The society that we live in does not believe in these things. They use the word, but they don't believe in these things. People are being held accountable today for things they said or did 30 years ago, they're disqualified. They're being canceled because they said or did something 30 years ago that is suddenly today not popular. We believe you could say something profoundly wrong 30 years ago, but if God has changed your nature, you are a new person. Whatever you've done, Whatever you've done, you live in a society that tells you low self-esteem is your biggest problem. We believe that pride and ego have caused way more problems than low self-esteem. And so we call our people to lives of humility seeing themselves as God sees them. And that is why we say to each other, be patient with one another, forbear one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And we believe in diversity. This is a culture that gains its identity through differences. We believe you are different for a purpose. It's because you belong to the whole. You are not separate from the whole. We live in a society that has become fractured with sectors of society warring against one another. And in the form of a peaceful, quiet, humble protest we practice lives of community this is a society where wealth has migrated in the last 30 years towards the one percent and we say give it away Okay? Now, I know some of you don't believe all this. I know some of you, there. Ah, that's just talk. That's okay. It's okay. Stay with us. Don't leave. And we'll get to you. These things are aspirational. So when we don't practice them, and there are times when we don't, 
don't think of us as hypocrites because I think we truly do want these things. Think of us as children, infants, who want very badly to be adults someday, but they just keep acting like kids. Someday, someday. A hypocrite pretends to like these things, but really likes something else. We actually like these things, but they're aspirational in nature. And these things are prophetic. These things are symbols of things to come. However interested you are in these things, everybody thinks this way in the land where you're going. Everybody thinks this way in the place where you're going. And these things are practical. They're immensely practical. They're institutional values, yes, and we own them as a church. But here's what I'd like you to do, and then I'm done. Sometime after you go home, or if you are part of a small group, I hope you are, when you get into that small group, could you just take a piece of paper and would you list these five qualities across a piece of paper? Transformation, humility, diversity, community, and generosity. Under each one of those words, would you make two columns? Here are things that we're going to start doing as a result of this being our value. What are we going to do practically uh, to practice transformation and be specific. And on the other half of the column, put what are we going to stop doing in order to be a more humble society? I was going to do this for you, but I thought it's better if you do it yourself. And I knew by then your eyes would be glazed over. So I thought, let me just send you home and say those are the two lists for each one of these words. Tell one another what you're going to start doing that you are not presently doing and what you will stop doing that you're already doing and be specific. For transformation, don't say, stop sinning. Stop. Mention your sin. Put it on there. For humility and generosity, put them down there. For now, I think the way for us to uh, close is with the prayer of um, one of the saints. Uh, St. Francis de Salas is one of the saints I met. Now, I didn't meet him. He's, but he's been dead about 400 years. But uh, um, he's one of the saints I met in my reading. And his, uh, his piece, Introduction to a Devout Life, was so powerful. It started me on this journey of looking inward at the deepest parts. In one of his journals, this are the words of St. Francis, and I would love it greatly if you would stand with me. And you would wrap this prayer around you as a summary to the message. Loving Savior, Help me to live your goodness and kindness each day. Remind me that my actions express who I am even more than my words. May I love as you love. Let me be good to those who wish me harm. Forgive those who need forgiveness and reach out in kindness to all I meet so they can experience the unconditional love of God. Set our hearts on fire for you. The people of God said, amen. Church, an hour ago we gathered uh, in the name of Christ and now we are sent in the name of Christ with the five values that we've just discussed. Let each one of us, every one of us, go out and practice them in the places where God has sent us. In his name, you are sent.